What should we learn about structure of high-level languages? Um, first, let me preface that I, I try to um, postpone this discussion, this discussion until the point I felt you were ready to understand you know, more of the intricacies of functional programming. So, um, so that is why I wanted to go a bit, so this way I can go a bit uh, deeper in, in, in why you should care and why, why it matters. Um, and a lot of these claims, as you will see, they're, they're really opinions. They're, they're not scientific, um, so they're more like uh, opinions of my own. Um, and they will be informal claims. So the whole goal of this discussion is not to try to find what is the best language. I hope you will uh, at least concur with me that there is no best language. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll learn what are the fundamental concepts in all programming languages. So we'll, we'll start by looking at what is similar in programming languages and then what is different in each like class of families of programming languages. And then why did we focus on functional programming? And finally, why do we care about Racket? Um, so just as an overview of the tone of the discussion, uh, we should be careful when we think about programming languages in seeing them not as a, like a club where I'm, I belong to this thing and I don't really care about anything else, you know, like a sports club. Uh, languages are really just tools, so you should look at them um, in a very dispassionate way. Of course, because a lot of people invest quite a lot of bit of time in learning a programming language, then they feel they need to justify it um, and just not study anything else because that's the only thing you you know, and then you get a bit defensive. But ideally, you should look at programming languages as just a tool, and they're each of them is going to be good for a certain kind of job. Um, so the main idea that I want to convey is that there is no best programming language, basically the point that I'm trying to say. Uh, we're going to see how they're similar, and theoretically, as you will see, and if you study 420, that's basically the, one of the main ideas behind that course, is that theoretically most programming languages are indeed equivalent. So it's not like you can express more, it's just how easy it is to express things. Um, so it's also about um, the balance of features and you cannot win all. So you might have something that is uh, more ergonomic but less performant and that's usually the balance that you're trying to achieve. So if you want something that is highly performant, uh, you want you need like a simpler interface, less abstraction, so you're probably more interested in C or Fortran for high performance computing. But if you want something like a high level to just describe pseudocode, maybe Python is something more interesting. We'll talk a bit about those different, um, why programming languages are good for this and that. Um, and essentially, I hope you, you perceive now a programming language as more of a computing interface. Uh, it's essentially, a user interface that we have to uh, control the program, the computer. So a program is just this recipe that is trying to, or this uh, abstraction on, on a certain behavior of, of, of my computer that I want it to make. Um, and finally, we're going to talk a bit about the importance of having functions as a first class value that is um, that can be passed around, it can use it as any other thing, as a number, there isn't really no diff there shouldn't really be a difference, and what can you gain about uh, this powerful abstraction. So, a very basic question you may be wondering is really why should you care about um, language semantics? So what is semantics? It's, it's really just the meaning of programs and uh, or, or really how they actually behave. So uh, when you say semantics is really what the language is and what the programming language can do for you and knowing what it can do for you is crucial, right? Otherwise you don't know how to do a program because it would be mostly guesswork. So you really need to understand its semantics. You need to understand what the programming language is capable of doing. Uh, it shouldn't be guesswork. It should be obvious to you. 
And that's why you should care at least about the notion of semantics. Uh, that's what we mean when we say, I, I know how to program programming language. Implicitly, what you're saying is, I understand its semantics. So, yeah, essentially, a programming language is going to act as the user interface to the computer, right? So you want to uh, write some behavior, a program, um, and you need to this program to be run by your computer. And the programming language is what is giving you uh, the concepts and abstractions that allow you to develop your program. Because we don't program in assembly, usually. <laughs> Some of us do, but... Um, okay, so then it is very important that the, the semantics is unambiguous and precise. Because otherwise you would look at the program and I would look what, and I would ask you, what does this do? And you wouldn't know how to answer. So if you're working for someone, they ask you to do something. It needs to be uh, clear what it is doing, what goal are you trying to achieve. Otherwise, you're just writing code aimlessly. And no one has a way to assess if you were successful or not. Um, so really understanding semantics, I was saying, is really a crucial part of it. Um, the semantics also defines a, a social contract, right? And also... I'm saying here a software contract, but really is a social contract because you have a piece of software and you need to know exactly where does the bug lay. Is it in my in the software that I wrote or is it in the expectations that someone had for me? Are they using my tool correctly or not? Uh, understanding that is very crucial, right? To, the blame game is actually quite important in any kind of business. Uh, so semantics really is crucial in this sense, right? Are you just using it wrong? Or is there a bug in the framework that you're using? Or maybe in the compiler that you're using? Um, another thing that I'm hoping you learn from this course is really how a lot of these language idioms are transferable knowledge. Um, thinking in terms of unique um, modules of computation, aka a function, is a very con powerful concept to have and it's so powerful that a lot of programming languages now have the notion of a lambda if you any programming language you may choose if you close your eyes you throw a pebble at a, a pool of programming languages you'll find one that has a lambda abstraction and has functions as first class values it's it's something that has been really uh, broadly adopted by programming languages in general uh, except probably for C, but even then you can pass uh, function pointers. Um, so there's a lot of these concepts that you're learning and how to combine, um, how to write combinators. I hope you learn how to understand fold as this, just this abstraction of reduction of values. And if you ever learn about a visitor pattern, um, that's basically doing, it's very easy to adapt a fold or to see to look at a fold as a as a, a a descent on a visitor pattern. So the way a visitor goes through uh, a tree of objects can be understood as just a fold operation, or possibly a map. So it's it really a lot of these functional patterns that you are learning. You are doing them when you're learning design patterns and programming and in, in, in functional programming. A lot of them are exactly the same thing, but just with different names. Um, so if you understand them here, you will very easily benefit from this knowledge in your, in, in your future careers. So let's think a bit about how our programming language is similar. So theoretically, and, and this is basically what is known as the Church-Turing thesis, the idea that um, the lambda calculus is equivalent to uh, a Turing machine, and a Turing machine just represents any kind of program that you would be able to do, and then any program that you do is Turing complete if you can uh, show that it can represent a Turing machine. So you have this equivalence and you can go from one way to the other. Um, this means that anything that you can do with a Turing machine, you can do with a lambda calculus, you can do with your favorite programming language. Um, and basically, you have this equivalence of expressiveness. Now, that doesn't mean that you are able to, you know, 
send an email with a Turing machine in a very obvious way or actually in a very efficient way. If you implement a Turing machine, you will see that it's quite slow. If you implement lambda calculus without numbers or without primitive values, you'll have probably the slowest language ever built. But it is equivalent. You can represent numbers, as I hope you've seen uh, if you are cur curious to look at uh, church, the church encoding. So a lot of these uh, notions are you are able to encode one and the other to, to, to show equivalent theoretical uh, equivalences between these various abstractions. They are just different ways of talking about the same thing. So a program that you do in C, you can represent the same program in another programming language. Another thing that we, I hope you've seen is that you might have a very completely di different programming language such as Racket, but a lot of the same concepts are the same. The notion of variables, the notions of abstraction, uh, the notion of uh, recursive definitions or recursion, all of these things, they keep popping up because they are how we know how to do things. Um, so how are la languages different then? Um, so before we even discuss that, I think it should be important to understand that a programming language is not fast or slow. When we say that a programming language like, let's say, C is fast and like, let's say, Python is slow, what we're really talking about is the current implementation, the best implementation that we know of, of C, and the best implementation that we know of, of Python. One is faster than the other. So you can write any kind of program, you will see that a Python program is probably 300 times slower than a, a C program. And I'm not making this up. So it's, it's really... or orders of magnitude slower. And there are reasons for that, but, but it's not the actual programming language that is slower, it's the implementation that is slower. But what we'll see is that there are certain computation models, computational models that are easier to adapt uh, and to reason about. So you can write a program that is fast uh, very quickly and see because possibly the, the abstraction, uh, the computer abstraction is, is lower. So it is, e it is easier to encode what your program is with respect to how it's going to be compiled and mapped out into a, a program that is going to be executing. Whereas with Python, you have a lot of layers of abstraction that might be slowing you up. Um, so there are conceptual implementation differences. And there, are, and there are computation models that are more efficient for certain problems, easier to implement. So one question that we usually say is that C is closer to metal. Um, but that's actually kind of not exactly true because what we know is that C is really old. So C compilers have a lot of accrued knowledge and they are really good at optimizing C code. And you haven't had the same amount of man hours invested in all the other programming languages, really, you don't. So we've been uh, working with C compilers and programs in a way uh, that has influenced how we write C programs and how we write C compilers. So it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship where the C compiler will become better and we will know how we should write C programs. And then, and then that's why they are because the compiler can assume more things than your programs if they behave in the way that the compiler expects it will run faster so there's this kind of feedback loop going on and if you are curious and interested about high performance computing that's basically how it works like a lot of optimizations that um, compilers do in, in hpc code high performance computing code is really these patterns that people programmers know how to do and it will generate really fast code but you can do something equivalent. The compiler doesn't know how to optimize it because you're naive. You don't have that experience of knowing how to lay out your code or, or write your loops in such a way. Then the compiler doesn't know because it's, it's unusual. It's not, it's not idiomatic C code, then it won't, it won't be fast. So it's not really true that C is bare metal. There is an abstraction going there. It's just that we have really good compilers. So I invite you to read uh, this very interesting paper on why C is not a low-level language.
uh, that was published on ACMQ. So another thing that is um, reasons on why languages are slower fast. So if you know anything about Python, you might know that the current implementation of Python, CPython, the most popular one, is actually quite slow in multi-threading. So if you want to do any kind of multi-threading, you, you shouldn't choose Python. So you shouldn't use Python because you're probably going to use CPython, and CPython is by design broken, in quotation marks, in terms of how uh, multi-threading is going to work. It's not. It's going to ser effectively serialize your code. Because it has a lock, so there's a contention point in how the interpreter is implemented, such that if you do any kind of multi-threading, so you would run multiple parts of your program at the same time, if they ever have to access any object field or anything like that, you will serialize those threads. So technically, there's really no good way of writing multi-threaded parallel code. The only way is multi-process. So you need to spawn multiple copies of the same program, and they need to communicate either via socks or any kind of shared um, shared memory um, provided by the OS. So if you want to write programs, although the language has no limitation in terms of conceptual limitation for writing uh, multi-threaded code, the reason is, the, the, the truth of the matter is that existing implementations of Python are slow for multi-threading. Uh, so feel free to follow this link and talk, uh, read a bit more about the global interpreter lock. So if you want to write uh, really fast um, multi-threaded code, you should definitely use either C or Java, but never, C, never Python, just because of the current implementations that we have. So another thing that I wanted to show you, and, and possibly even in, in a future version of CS450, is maybe we'll learn how to implement a language like this. But the idea is that there are some programming languages they are really constrained they're very limited but very powerful for the kind of problems that we want so i don't know if you ever heard of the the send more money uh problem uh, the basic idea is that it's it's like a puzzle where you have um an addition where you have s e n d plus m o r e and then equals m o n e i send more money you have a, an addition where the result is money and the two, uh, so you have a variable, each variable S, E, N, D, M, O, R, E, and so on. Each variable is a possible, it's a number that could range from zero to nine. And the idea is, can you figure out how much money I'm asking you to give me? So if I do send plus more equals money, that should give you a, a valid equation. So how much is that? Um, there are programming language programming languages that are designed really just to solve these kinds of uh, known as constraint solving problems. Um, so Prolog is very famous for that and extensions of Prolog for constraint uh, language programming uh, problems. So in this case I'm defining, I'm, I'm just showing how you would go about and encode this problem in Prolog and it will give you the answer that you want. Uh, with just these 10 lines of code. Something that if you try to do in Python or in C, it's really not trivial because you have to think about all possible paths and go back. You have to do some backtracking and all the variations of where S, E, and D. So it's, it's basically a state exploration problem. And, and by default, Java, C, Python, they're not designed for these kinds of problems. You might be really good if you find a really good framework. But a framework is really just a programming language, essentially, right? It's just abstracting some computation problem. So, so yeah, what I wanted to, to show you is just a, an excerpt of a programming language program. So this is a program in CPL that lets you solve these kinds of um, puzzles. Um, it's very good if you have some kind of um, a very common problem, and this is actually something that uh, a student of mine brought up uh, last semester. Um, they have uh, a little baby who was um, who is in the daycare, 
and all the dads have to figure out uh, the time. You know, someone needs to be there or something, so they have to, sh to have a shared schedule for everyone to pick and choose. So there's all sorts of constraints. You know, this guy can in this day, but he cannot in that day. So how do you find the best a distribution that satisfies everyone? It would be these kinds of problems that you want to look at. And there are modules for Python and for Java that just are implementing constraint solving uh, as a framework. So CPL is great for those kinds of problems. Um, so essentially, let's summarize what we've learned. How are uh, programming languages different? What we've seen is, is we saw mainly three aspects. Um, implementation details. So it could be that you have a really good compiler or you made a really bad design choice like in Python. Um, the model really matters. So if you have something like a problem that is very well suited to Prolog, if you just implement in a Prolog, you can do it in 10 lines. But if you do it in Python, it will be 500 lines. Um, and the domain also matters, right? So if you, if you think about it, if you want to do any kind of machine learning, you probably want to use Python because TensorFlow is highly optimized. There's a lot of code for it. Uh, you might just want to use that. Uh, or you want to use R because it's more a statistical problem. There's all sorts of libraries and software already designed for it. So really what you want is what is your problem? And I'll give you the, the programming language. That's how you should approach this. But if languages are so different, why should we really care about um, learning them well just learning different concepts and and it's it's like you have to change the way you think to approach your problem and that's really how you become you know a veteran programmer really programming is just prob problem solving and the way we solve a lot of problems is really because we've seen them before <laughs> that's that's the best answer right you a lot of people just know how to solve a lot of things because they've seen a lot of things. They've been in situations where they had to think outside the box and they saw, oh, usually when I have this, even if they do it implicitly, that's what they're doing. When I, and, and when I'm, when I have to deal with this scenario, I usually do it in this way and that kind of fix it. But you have to be exposed to these different ways of solving things. You have to be exposed to different scenarios. So learning a programming language that is different not like learning Java and C++, I mean, although even that could, could help you a bit, but I'm really talking about learning a, a really different programming language is really a good thing to do. And that's something you should try to do moving forward, even after CS450. Um, there's this really cool book called The Pragmatic Programmer where they just giving you tips on how to be a programmer. Uh, and one nice thing they say is really this idea that you should learn a programming language every year, a new one. And of course, you, you don't need to do that every year, every year, but at least in the beginning, you should try to do it every year, uh, just so you have, you understand a few languages. Um, know, learning how to program in Haskell, learning how to program in P Prolog. When I learned how to do, how to program in Prolog was really, I remember the day that I've learned. It's, it was so impactful in my, um, in me learning, becoming a better programmer, because it really made me think about things very differently. So it was an aha moment. Um, and Haskell was a bit like that as well. A lot of programming languages, just because they are um, giving you a new way of looking at problems, really change you as a programmer. Um, and of course, if you know a lot of programming languages, that means that you are, you have a lot of experience, you can adapt to uh, multiple domains, right? You will have more job opportunities because some job opportunities will say, oh, we need a programmer in C++ or we need a Java. You only know one programming language, you might not be able to qualify for a certain job. Um, learning, for instance, learning Python made me a better Java programmer and a lot of programming languages they, they do that. You learn one and you become better at the language you just knew before that. Um, and also by learning new languages, you, you get more access to uh, more frameworks, right? So if you learn Python, you can use TensorFlow. If you learn R, you can use all sorts of statistics, uh, frameworks, and so on. 
So finally, why should you care about functional programming? Um, so first, we kind of need to define what is functional programming, right? So um, there are many definitions depending on you know who is talking and what they're talking about. But usually, what when I'm talking today about functional programming, I'm really talking about uh, two main things, and the first one is where mutation is discouraged. That doesn't mean is disallowed. It is possible, of course, and it will. It is reality. You have to deal with mutation, but but you don't do it by default. Secondly, is higher order functions serve as a generalization device. So by this we mean we use functions very heavily to abstract and reuse code. Um, so why should we care about it? We why should we care about functional programming? Um, first of all. Mutation and high order functions, they're really a great tool to have on your belt as a programmer. So you can write better code just by writing Python code that is immutable and Java code that is immutable. And in fact, there's lots of libraries. We'll see, we'll, I'll show you a slide next where you have, um, I will show you some libraries for a lot of programming languages where we talk about mutation. Um, but really as a high level, we'll talk about these two things. Um, but we'll also talk about how functional programming has been the test bed for programming language design uh, for the past development of programming language th theory. And also because functional programming is trendy, um, as you will, I don't know if you're aware of, but most programming languages very recently in the past, I guess, five to ten years, have been incorporating functional programming um, capabilities to, to their programming languages. So C++, Java, C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, they're all, they all have um, all the functional programming idioms that you have. A lot of them don't have tail recursion, which means they will be, you can only do like toy things, but um, some of them even have that, like C Sharp. And I don't know about JavaScript, but there are also ways to, to go around the lack of uh, tail recursion. Uh, if you're curious, Google trampolines. Okay, so why should we discourage mutation? Um, and this is, there. I would say there are two main reasons. And the first is, is really, first one is maintainability. Code that is immutable is not surprising. No one will mutate it behind the scenes. You will not pass the data structure and some other code will mutated you know exactly what's going on because there's nothing that can go on, on right the the data cannot disappear the data cannot be altered and that is great to know right you know that the bug does not come from you know some some condition that you forgot to do and then uh, you mutated a field or removed something from from a collection or whatever another thing that is very important especially now that we have so many you know as as you probably know the way the processors have been developed or have been developing um, in terms of hardware, they've limited, we've been faced with a, a limit in terms of how fast they can go. So what hardware manufacturers did was they made more of them. So instead of making them faster, they just made, oh, now your, your processor has two cores, that means they will run twice as fast. And that is not true, it won't run twice as fast because your code has to be um, now able to do two things at the same time and if it's not it just will run as slow as it was before or as fast as it was before it won't run faster so there is a big importance being um, done in making your programs faster and this is if you like games that's something that was felt very strongly and it's still I believe it's still going on um, in the past, I guess, 10 years, where games had to really become multi-threaded. So at some point, because you really had, there's no way you could go faster, and sometimes it was, the bottleneck was not in the GPU, it was actually in the CPU. Um, and if it's in the CPU, you really have to change the way you develop your program so that it becomes multi-threaded. And a lot of games um, started doing that, 
and become way faster because processors, they, are, they have multiple cores and multiple cores means you can run multiple threads at the same time. Um, so if you have data structures that are immutable, you already are preparing your, your future proofing your software because if you at some point decide to make your code uh, multi-threaded, you will need to think about, oh, now I have a data structure, I need to share it between two threads. They're running at the same time. So if they are mutating that object, I don't know, I don't know what's gonna happen. Honestly, you won't know. And there's, there are some ways to do it. You could just create a notion known as a lock and you could kind of control who holds the data structure that is shared. But the easiest way is really don't mutate it. If you, if you don't have to, just make it immutable. So immutability is really crucial to make code faster. It's actually one of the easiest ways to make your code faster is just change it so that it's immutable. So then I just gave you a few links of frameworks, um, popular frameworks that have been developed for different programming languages such as JavaScript, Scala, Java, C++, and .NET uh, that allow you to uh, write immutable code. So the other thing that we talked about when we're talking about functional programming is higher order functions and, and why should you um, care about them? Why should we even use higher order functions if we just have objects? Well, everyone knows how to use a function, right? An object, you don't know the order, you don't know which method you should call first, if there's an order or not. Uh, if you can call them at any times. If it's just a function, there's no doubt. It's just a function. You inputs in, output out. Very easy, right? It's just a pipe. So um, it makes it way easier to think about. Uh, and you can combine them, as we've seen with all the combinators that we've learned, such as fold and, and currying and um, filters, maps, all, that, all those things. They allow you to combine functions to very powerful things. So another thing I mentioned about was how uh, functional programming has been the, the researcher's petri dish. Petri, petri dish. Petri dish? Oh, God. I forgot how to say that. Um, so ever since the beginning, people have been using functional programming languages as they are the choice of development for for uh, programming language theorists. That means that basically all the features that you're using in programming languages, they started in, in, in a functional programming language, uh, such as garbage collection, generics, higher order functions, type inference, algebraic data types, recursion, all of that stuff started in functional programming languages. Um, and Another thing that is very important and an, a, a good reason for you to care about it is because of the new, of, new wave of programming languages. If you look at Swift, uh, if you develop any kind of programs for Mac OS or, uh, sorry, iOS, yes, for the, you know, iPhones and uh, tablets, iPhone tablets, I forget how they called, iPads, you have, you're probably going to be using Swift, which is a, in a big part a heavily functional programming inspired um, programming language. Uh, Rust, which is developed, which is, was created by Mozilla uh, as an alternative to C, is also very functional programming uh, meets C. F Sharp, which is developed by .NET, is basically um, ML is not machine learning. It's um, ML means meta language. Uh, just a name. It's just people say ML. We don't really care what it means, but it's the one of the oldest pro, uh, functional programming languages. Uh, F Sharp is um, in like an ancestor, like Racket is an ancestor. Sorry, a descendant of Scheme and Scheme a descendant of Lisp. F Sharp is a descendant of ML. Uh, but for .NET, uh, Elixir, if you care about web development or REST uh, or sorry microservices and all that kind of stuff. Elixir is really cool, uh, a really cool programming language. Clojure as well, very similar to Lisp, uh, similar-ish to Racket as well. 
Um, it's a very cool programming language. You can also develop for it to the, on the web and all that. So all pretty cool languages. Um, they're all heavily in, inspired by functional programming uh, principles. Um, so the final thing you might be wondering is who is using functional programming? Um, and here I just list uh, companies on the right and each bullet has a programming language. Um, OCaml, so if you ever used Facebook or Doc, if you've heard of Docker, I hope you did. Uh, Citrix, they do hardware virtualization and finance, they, they really like OCaml. Uh, I, I personally is one of my favorite programming languages, OCaml. Um, Haskell has been used by Facebook, Microsoft and Google, Intel, uh, Erlang by WhatsApp, uh, and this that 365 which is a very famous um, ad role for ads. Erlang is this distributed functional programming language, really old, developed by Ericsson. It's a really cool programming language. Elixir is built on top of the VM of Erlang, so it's also kind of like distributed and uh, really cool. It's used by Pinterest, um, notably. F Sharp has been used by, of course, Microsoft, Kaggle, Credit Suisse uh, for gaming backends. That's cool. I, I think it's more for servers. Record, which you've been learning, has been famously uh, used by Naughty Dog, uh, Last of Us, if you guys know of those of that game, um, game development. I think also game script, yeah, game scripting is very famously uses um, functional programming languages, or variations of racket scheme. Um, so Scala, if you ever heard of that, is basically for the Java VMs, famously being developed by, or used by Twitter and Netflix and Tumblr. Um, if you ever heard about ReasonML, it's um, ML again, not machine learning. It's because Reason is a descendant of ML, developed by Facebook. Um, okay, in the next video, we're going to learn about mutable environments. So I hope you had fun. This is more of a relaxed kind of video. Um, you don't have to memorize any of this. It's more for your own curiosity. So have a good one.